Hello, everyone. Sorry, having some technical issues here on Wednesday. I'm Athena Caballero, HR Consulting Manager with Higher Level, a women-owned human capital management company. Today, you have joined our High Notes webinar program, and we'll be talking about hot employment law updates to drive your business compliance. A few housekeeping things before we start. This webinar will take approximately 60 minutes. It will be recorded. You are set up in listen only mode, but you can drop questions that you may have into the chat. We will address those at the end of the High Notes uh, presentation. And um, today we, of course, are joined by John Gilbert, employment law attorney and shareholder at Sandbird Phoenix. He has been trying cases on behalf of public and private employers for over 40 years in labor, employment, civil rights, higher education, and constitutional law. John is currently the assistant state's attorney for Madison and Eppingham, Eppingham County, an adjunct faculty member for the School of Business at SIU Edwardsville, my alma mater. He is also the hearing board chair for the Illinois Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission. Thank you for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to John. Thank you uh, for that wonderful introduction, which I wasn't able to hear. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for participating in today's webinar. Uh, I also want to extend my gratitude to Higher Level for making this possible and uh, to Athena and Aaron especially for their help. And I'm sorry for the technical glitch, but uh, if any of you have any questions or need to communicate, please use the chat function because I do have access to that. Um, since I am a lawyer, I have to start off with lawyer type stuff. A couple of disclaimers. Uh, first of all, uh, this presentation is not legal advice and uh, participants should not consider it to be legal advice. If you have specific legal questions, always consult your own counsel. Uh, I'd be happy to do that, but uh, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, it's not legal advice. And the second disclaimer I have to give ethically is that uh, this participating in the seminar does not create an attorney-client relationship. All right, so now that all that's out of the way, let's talk about uh, some labor and employment law issues that are of interest. Uh, any of you who uh, have any familiarity with labor and employment law know that this is an area of high anxiety uh, for labor and employment attorneys and for HR professionals. Uh, for some reason, Congress, as well as state legislatures, love to legislate, thank you, in the area of employment and labor law, uh, because it seems to me over the years I've been doing this, uh, employers are, are popular targets. Uh, and so both on the federal and state levels, we have issues that continue to uh, arise and uh, become targets of legislation. So let me start, as our uh, program indicates, with uh, a little bit of what's going on with the National Labor Relations Board. Now, keep in mind that uh, those of you who do not have unionized uh, workplaces, organized workplaces, the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act, still applies to your employees even if you don't have uh, unionized or collective bargaining units in the workplace. So that's why it's important to sort of stay up with what's happening with the NLRB. And Interestingly enough, although not surprising, uh, with each president comes new members to the National Labor Relations Board. And of course, uh, they reflect the political orientation of the president. So when Bush was president, uh, we had uh, a fairly employer-friendly board. Uh, when Obama became president, 
uh, that's changed drastically. And the NLRB became much more union friendly. Uh, not surprising again, because you know the, the Democrat party um, is uh, heavily uh, involved with and funded by organized labor, even though organized labor on the rank and file level level isn't consistently supportive of Democrat candidates. But uh, but when Obama's board was in, and you know he was president for two terms, we began to see uh, quite a bit of employer or union friendly rulings and policies from the board. When Trump was president, that changed, and the Trump board spent quite a bit of time reversing precedent that was set by the Obama board. Well, guess what? Now that Biden is president, his board is beginning to go back to the policies of the Obama board, slowly, but surely. I mean, he has only been in office 18 months, so, you know, or even less than that, but things are changing. And a couple of the areas that we're seeing action in from the Biden board are one, unit determinations. Now, unit determination means that when a union files to represent a collective bargaining unit, it files what's called an RC petition, and they state in the petition who they want in the unit, which employees. And of course, unions frequently will choose a smaller unit because it's easier to get elected. If they have a larger unit, theoretically anyhow, and usually practically, the votes against the unit will be uh, greater. So the unions often will try to choose the smallest collective bargaining unit, especially when they wanna get their foot in the door. And that gives you sometimes fragmented units. In other words, a small unit, which really ought to be a larger unit to be more appropriate because the employees have a greater community of interest, as it's called. Well, uh, starting with the Obama board, the uh, unit determination contested cases before the NLRB uh, began to uphold smaller fractured units so that, at least I think politically, so that the unions would have a greater chance of success in an election. So that, and the board began to say, and this, I mean, they're, they're really not totally wrong on this. The board began to say back then that smaller units were okay as long as they were appropriate, even if there were a larger unit that would be appropriate uh, based on the community of interest of the employees. So they began to say, well, really our standard is as long as the unit is an appropriate unit, it doesn't have to be the most appropriate unit. And we began to see a little bit of a shift away from that during the Trump board, but now, the Biden board is solidly back uh, into endorsing smaller units as the appropriate bargaining unit. And again, the reason that's important is because it's easier for the union to win the election. So uh, that's something to keep an eye on. And if you have a collective bargaining activity at your workplace, you can expect that the unions will probably start out with smaller units and then once they have their foot in the door, try to organize other groups of employees. Uh, another area that we're seeing, uh, I guess, somewhat of a change, uh, or at least going back to what uh, the Obama board did is with uh, health insurance. One of the biggest problems that we have in traditional labor law is negotiating collective bargaining agreements, and health insurance, of course, is a mandatory subject of bargaining, so the union is entitled to bargain over the details of health insurance. 
The problem, of course, as all of you know, is that it's kind of hard to dictate exactly what you want in your health insurance plan. If you're fully funded, it's dictated by the insurance company pretty much. I mean, there is some give and take, but you know, you have plans to choose from that you really can't often alter. If you're self-insured or a combination of self-insured and fully funded, you might have a little more control over that, but once you're locked in, uh, each year, if it changes, the union technically uh, has a right to bargain over the provision of health insurance and what those plans look like. For a brief while, while uh, Trump was president, the NLRB was saying that, look, if you're in the middle of a contract, not negotiations, but a contract, three-year or four-year contract, and you're gonna have to change your health insurance annually, it's really not practical to bargain over that each year, especially when you may not be able to change the details. So the board at that, during those times, took the position that as long as you informed the union and you met and discussed it with the union, that was enough. In other words, if you were bargaining in May and your plan renewed in July, as long as you informed the union of the changes and what was going on and you talked about it, you didn't necessarily have to bargain to impasse and then implement. So it was a little more of a liberal standard. Now, uh, recent cases from the Biden board uh, endorse bargaining when there are changes. Uh, and so uh, it's gonna, it's gonna create a little bit uh, of a more difficult situation for employers who are organized because now, you know, you all have to sit down, bargain with the union uh, way in advance of when your renewal takes effect. Uh, so it's again, additional burdens on employers and a more union and employer friendly policy. Probably the uh, most, or the, the board approach with the greatest impact is in the area of employer policies and practices. Most uh, employment, or most employers, have policies that we have written for years and years and years. Policies about confidentiality, policies about uh, social media, policies about um, you know any range of of subjects, uh, you know, publicity, uh, at, at when an employee can be on the premises. You know, it just depends on the employer. But most employers have employee policies, which we've had for years that are pretty standard. Well, during the Obama administration, his board uh, took aim at standard, typical employer policies and devised a test that, <coughs> excuse me, applied to those policies. And if the policies didn't meet the test, then they were determined to be in violation of the National Labor Relations Act. The test was basically whether an employee could reasonably interpret the employer's personnel policies as interfering with the employee's rights under the NLRA. Now, the problem with that standard, of course, is it's very subjective. And who's gonna make that determination? Of course, the labor board is ultimately gonna make that determination. So it was kind of a, you know, a pretty loose standard. And uh, management side attorneys fought very hard about this, challenged these rules. But for those years during the Obama board, they were uh, shooting down 
standard employment policies left and right. And it was a problem because if the test is, can an employee reasonably interpret this rule as interfering with your rights under the National Labor Relations Act, that's a very broad, subjective standard. And of course, the people who are enforcing that rule are the ones who make that determination. So uh, management side attorneys, like myself, really thought that the board was kind of abusing its discretion. And anytime they found a personnel policy that they thought they didn't like or could have an adverse effect on an employee if enforced, they canceled. So that's what we had. Now, the Trump board began, the Trump board adopted a new standard, which we could do an hour on that alone, but basically it was a standard of reasonableness. Is it reasonable? Is the rule reasonable with respect to employees' rights under the NLRA? Well, that resurrected quite a few employment policies that the Obama board had shot down. So, and it was a much easier standard to work with because it was really a, what we call in the law a rule of reason. Is it reasonable? In other words, is it reasonable to say an employee can't be on premises when the employee shift is over, okay? Um, and the, the Trump board would say yes, because the employer has the right to control who's on their premises when the employee's not working. The Obama board had said no, because it, the guy might be there, the guy or gal might be there uh, to conduct union business. You know, So they just, the Trump board contracted what the Obama board had done uh, as much as it could in, in four years. Um, so this is one we need to be watching on because they the board has put out a request for input from employers and the labor law community as to whether or not they should change the standard that was created by the Trump board and go back to the standard under the Obama board. Now, so the comment period I think is still open and there will be thousands of pages of comments from industry, from legal groups on both sides of the issue. My guess is they're gonna go back to the old standard because uh, you know Biden's commitment to organized labor was no different than Obama's. And so I think we're gonna probably see, uh, <coughs> excuse me, more cases in the, in the future of attacks against standard personnel policies that um, were sort of uh, rejuvenated by the Trump board. Uh, one other area that is uh, a that the NLRB just in uh, December indicated that it was going to take a look at again is misclassification of employees, uh, which basically means uh, consideration of overturning a case uh, that was uh, decided in 2019. And, go, and, and they're asking for comment about whether they should go back to the standard that was under the Obama board. And <clears throat> the five second version of this is an effort by the board to uh, enforce how it defines an employee versus an independent contractor. And they want to use uh, what we call the economic realities test, uh, and uh, which means not that which means that you look at the economic reality of situation and essentially if a person who's doing work for you pretty much depends on you for their economic survival uh, then they're an employee not an independent contractor regardless of any of the other traditional trappings of independent contractors for example 
you have an agreement with them. Uh, they're not exclusive to you. They bring their own tools. Uh, you don't control how they do the work. Those are the standard common law distinctions between employees and uh, independent contractors. Well, both the Department of Labor and the NLRB uh, want to, used to, under Obama, uh, be much stricter about who's an employee uh, and much more liberal in the sense of this economic realities test. So uh, I think that the uh, comment period for the, the NLRB's uh, determination and asking for a comment from the public about switching back to the old standard of economic realities test um, was, uh, the deadline was March 1st. So I think we'll see shortly uh, a change in those standards uh, because they are being very aggressive uh, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind and in management attorneys' uh, opinions that they want to reshape labor law uh, back to what it was like uh, under the Obama administration. So those are uh, the sort of hot areas that the NLRB is looking at. One of the ways you can stay current on this is... Um, if you're not doing this already, you go to the NLRB website, which is nlrb.gov, uh, and you can sign up for their correspondence that keeps you abreast of what cases are being decided on a daily basis, what requests for information they want. I mean, all the activities of the board, uh, all the way down to the regional level. If you, if you want to see regional decisions, but that's the best way really to stay current with what's happening with the NLRB. And I think we're gonna see a more rapid pace of trying to reshape labor law back to the Obama era uh, through this board. And I think they're gonna wanna do it quickly because you know nobody knows who's gonna be president in 2024. Uh, nobody knows what's going to happen to Congress in 2022. And so I think we're going to see some pretty rapid adoption of more pro-union and employer-friendly uh, policies and practices and cases from the NLRB. Um, I had the outline we have talks about another issue that um, has uh, that we see from time to time. Uh, for a while, the big issue was whether or not unions could put up a giant inflatable rat at a uh, work site where they were either protesting the primary employer or sometimes the a secondary employer. And uh, Scabby was the name of the rat. And the courts have uniformly held that if the union wants to picket, if the picket is lawful, uh, then scabby can be inflated and be parked at the workplace. If you've ever seen this, and I have seen it several times, um, it's just this ugly, frightening rat that's about uh, you know 10 feet tall, probably. Uh, and it's Scabby the Rat. There's more than one, uh, but unions, uh, certainly around my area, geographically use it. Uh, but it has been determined that that's legitimate uh, expression by the union as long as the picketing itself is lawful. One other issue, and this is the case that I referenced about a case study uh, in the, uh, of a violation of the NLRA was an interesting case decided about a year ago, actually a year ago today, by the United States Court of Appeal for the Seventh Circuit. U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit uh, geographically covers Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. And uh, some of the cases that involve violations of the 
or unfair labor practices under the National Labor Relations Act make their way to the Court of Appeals because once the Labor Board rules, the appeal of the Labor Board decision is to a Court of Appeals, either the DC Circuit Court of Appeals or the Court of Appeals in the geographical area where the employer allegedly committed or didn't commit the unfair labor practice. So we the case that um, I wanted to mention because this is a frequent issue in the workplace that is organized is uh, a case called Constellation Brands versus the National Labor Relations Board. As I indicated, it was decided a year ago today by the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. And uh, the short version of this is uh, Constellation Brands operates Woodridge, Woodbridge Winery. And at one of its facilities, uh, they have employees called, well, they have a cellar department. The cellar department is where they turn grapes into wine. Sounds like a pretty good job to me. Uh, before the uh, wine is bottled. So the union, the Teamsters, represented the seller employees. Uh, during the collective bargaining process, one of the seller employees, a fellow by the name of Manuel Chavez, wore a, on his safety vest, he wrote on the back of it, in big letters with a marker, seller lives matter. All right. So uh, Woodridge, Woodbridge was not happy about this because uh, for really obvious reasons. Woodbridge took it as he was making fun of the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, so they told him that if he continued to wear the vest or wear that st statement on the vest, he would be fired. So event, he wore it for one week and then decided to take it off and filed an unfair labor practice charge against the employer, saying that it violates his rights under uh, the National Labor Relations Act as he has a right to wear union insignias or union or statements that support uh, the union, which is generally true. So the Court of Appeals took up the case and said, hey, uh, well, the NLRB had held that the employer violated the act by making him remove the, the statement from his safety vest. And the Court of Appeals said, that the board was right, that he had a right under the National Labor Relations Act to do that. Because, and the board and the court reiterated the law that had been debated uh, really during Bush board, Obama board, Trump board, and this was under the Trump board, and uh, the court says that uh, the standard is whether the employee was engaged in protected conduct under the act and the employer interfered with that. And the court said in this case, they did interfere because the law allows an employee the right to wear union insignia, except in three situations. One is, special circumstances to ban it, uh, which means that the message or the insignia, or sometimes it's a pin or a hat or a headband or some other type of accessory uh, that supports the union. Uh, and the special circumstances where an employer can prevent it include safety, jeopardy, damaging machinery or products, uh, riling up employees to not do their jobs, uh, interfering with a public image, uh, a well-established public image, I might add. And that's one, those are the special circumstances. The second 
uh, uh, Lamet the second. Those are those are the circumstances. So the court analyzed the case and determined that nobody complained about uh, Chavez wearing that saying, so if seller lives matter, even though the company thought employees would be offended and it was a political statement that the company did not want to endorse, the, there was no evidence of that. Nobody complained. Nobody complained to Chavez. Nobody complained to management during the week that he wore that vest. So the court says there's really no problem with that uh, with regard to uh, what he was doing. There was no disruption in the workplace, no problem with morale, no problem with production, no problem with safety. So um, even though those are sometimes bases on which you can discipline an employee for a union insignia, if you will, uh, they didn't have any evidence of that. <clears throat> they also, the company said though that uh, this type of message appealed to ethnic prejudices. And the court said, there's no evidence of that. Um, and so they shot down the company's uh, reason for that. Um, they also said that Woodbridge anyway, <coughs> excuse me. Woodbridge said that employees were upset uh, and therefore employee dissension was uh, a risk. And the court said, but there's no evidence of that. Nobody complained to Chavez. Nobody really other than management people complained to the uh, employer. So the court said, you know, that lack of evidence is the problem on that one. And finally, the court, uh, uh, Woodbridge said, hey, this kind of statement interferes with our public image. Uh, and the court said, well, there's no evidence of that. That's pure speculation. They didn't have any testimony, any surveys, anything that would suggest that their public image was hurt by this guy wearing that slogan on his vest. So uh, the court in that case held that this type of expression was all right. And really reconfirmed what we now know uh, is the law that unless you can really show that wearing a union insignia or saying or a button or a hat or a whatever uh, you might be like a t-shirt um, unless you can really show it's going to disrupt the workplace or hurt the employer uh, you're going to lose that case if you if you discipline the employee. Uh, <clears throat> now, let me uh, turn the page, if you will, to uh, some state law uh, issues. Now, not all of you may be from Illinois, so I apologize in advance, but uh, states, many states, primarily industrial states, have been very active in certain areas of employment regulation, uh, which in Illinois leads the way in the Midwest. I mean, we're fond of, employment lawyers anyway, are fond of now calling Illinois the California of the Midwest. We have some of the most far-reaching employment laws in the country. Some of you may be aware and may have already been sued under a famous law that only Illinois has, which is the Biometric Information Protection Act. Uh, there are th literally thousands of lawsuits that have been brought under this act dealing with the collection and storage of biometric information, fingerprints, retinal scans, uh, facial recognition, uh, you name it. If it's an electronic way to identify employees for any purpose, it's covered by this act. And the problem is that lawyers are suing under this act any employer that has any contact with Illinois. And there are literally thousands of class action cases out there 
dealing with violations of the act. So that's one illustration of how, I guess uh, you could say progressive Illinois uh, continues to be with regard to uh, regulation of the workplace. So BIPA, uh, which is the act I was just talking about, that gets a lot of publicity. But there are other, there's other legislation that took effect in 2022 and some uh, still in 2021 uh, that have major impacts on the workplace. Probably the one with the most impact is a statute which was an amendment to the Illinois Human Rights Act, which prohibits considering an individual's criminal conviction history in making employment decisions. Now, like a lot of states, Illinois had ban the box legislation. Ban the box legislation was simply that, well, not simply, but was that if you are going to take somebody's criminal history into account, you have to let them know. You have to not even ask for it until the employee has been offered a job or at least interviewed. And uh, the new statutes um, changes that. Essentially, the way that employment lawyers are looking at this, the ban the box law is basically useless anymore in light of the change to the, uh, to the statute, to the Illinois Human Rights Act with regard to uh, conviction. And again, it's a complicated statute. It's not easy to follow. You need legal advice to follow it if you are in any way considering criminal history information uh, in an employment decision. And the, the act presents hurdles uh, that employers have to overcome. And each of those hurdles is uh, a, an opening for litigation. So uh, it's, it has not been easy advising clients on how to deal with this statute, uh, which took effect about a year ago. Uh, and essentially it requires uh, employers not to take into account anyone's criminal conviction information in making employment decisions. Uh, with two exceptions. One is uh, what's called, if there's a substantial relationship between the criminal offenses and the job position sought or held. Now, substantial relationship, uh, there are standards for determining that in the statute, but they're, they are just grounds for litigation if the applicant disagrees or if the Department of Human Rights disagrees. Uh, the other exception is that uh, the employment of the individual creates an unreasonable risk to property or safety or welfare of others. And again, there are standards in the statute for that, but they are uh, standards on which reasonable people can disagree. Uh, so, for example, uh, the duration of time is one of them, since the conviction. Well, depending upon the offense, I might think 10 years is enough. You might think 10 years is not enough. So we'll fight over that. And, you know, we're off to the races on a Department of Human Rights complaint. So it really makes it difficult to uh, consider the criminal conviction history of an applicant. There also, there has to be an interactive assessment. In other words, you offer the person a job, then you check their criminal history information, and you find some. Then you have to have what they call an interactive assessment with the individual before making a decision. So we have now a form we send to the uh, employee or the applicant's candidate uh, of a preliminary decision notice. The applicant 
or the uh, candidate then has five days to respond to it. Then uh, in this uh, interaction, uh, you make a final decision and you send that to the employee in writing and tell them uh, why they were disqualified, what your reasoning was, and what procedures are in effect to contest that. So uh, that's a problem. I mean, it's a, a, a series of obstacles rife with the risk of litigation uh, when you consider the criminal history, conviction history of a, a candidate or an applicant. Uh, there's a lot, there's more to it than that, and you should get legal advice. You probably have already if you're an HR person. Uh, but it, it is a difficult area, and our law, Illinois statute, is about the most advanced in the country at this point with regard to that subject matter. So that's one to uh, keep in mind uh, and watch out for, because the process of enforcement initially is through the Illinois Human Rights Act, which then can end you up in court ultimately. Uh, another area of uh, state law regulation, if you will, in the employment arena is uh, Illinois statute on equal pay certification. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because it only applies, well, only. It applies to employees, uh, employers with 100 or more employees, but you have to now certify uh, that you're an uh, equal pay employer. And there's a huge process uh, through the Department of Human Rights uh, that uh, you should be familiar with, but you'll be notified by the state of Illinois uh, to submit your information. So, um, you know, and they're very slow about it right now. So, but just be mindful that if you have more than 100 full time employees, equivalent full-time employees, FTEs, as we call it, as you know, uh, you will have to follow this equal pay certification registration law. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another law that took effect on January 1st uh, was really more of a, what I call a, a pain in the rear law. Uh, it's a disclosure statute that if you offer health insurance, uh, you now have to provide all of your employees uh, information about what you offer, the details of the plan, which normally you would do because of your annual notification of employees uh, from your health insurance provider. I mean, we already have to do this under federal law. Well, now Illinois has tacked on the uh, uh, statute that took effect with regard uh, to disclosure of health insurance details to your employees who are, uh, to all your employees. Uh, two other major areas that I'd like to talk about, and um, probably since we got started late, uh, I might have to run over a little bit, I hope that's okay. Uh, but there are two other areas I'd like to touch on before uh, we say goodbye. One is an area that has garnered a lot of attention nationally, uh, and that is the area of non-compete uh, non -compete agreements, NCAs, or non-solicitation non agreements, NSAs. Uh, some states, well, one state, two states maybe, have banned them outright. So you can't have non-compete agreements in certain states. Uh, most states, yes. Well, Illinois took a sort of middle of the road approach, if you will. Uh, under the Illinois Freedom to Work Act, uh, prior to its amendments that took effect this year, uh, non-competes were not allowed for employees who were considered low wage employees. In other words, anybody who made less than who made $13 an hour or less. You could not have a non-compete. It's illegal. Well, they changed the law last year to take effect this year uh, to make it much more complicated. Uh, and it was effective in January. It applies to covenants not 
to compete and covenants not to solicit. And of course, covenants not to solicit are those where if a person leaves, they can't try to get other employees or customers to go with them. So uh, again, the quick version of this one is that uh, it forbades uh, NCAs and NSAs uh, for employees who, they took out the reference to low wage employees and now they have a graduated scale of uh, who you can't have a non-compete with. And the, the wage levels are different for non-compete versus non, non-solicitation. So uh, right now until 2026, if an employee makes more than $75,000 per year, uh, then a covenant not compete, not covenant not to compete uh, is illegal and void. Uh, unless it meets certain circumstances, certain requirements under the statute uh, that are listed in the statute. <clears throat> that goes all the way up to $90,000 in 2037. Uh, which I'm not going to really worry about because I'll be too old by then to uh, to care. Uh, now, for covenants not to solicit, the thresholds are lower, forty-five thousand until uh, 2026. So uh, be mindful that if your company uses covenants not to compete and covenants not to solicit, you have to follow the statute and um, be able to make sure that you meet all the requirements for enforcing those uh, that, uh, that are contained in this statute. And again, it took effect January 1, 2022. However, the nice part is it only applies prospectively. So it only applies to covenants not to compete and covenants not to solicit that are entered into on January 1, 2022 or thereafter. So uh, when this was passed uh, back in, gosh, when was that? Uh, last fall, I believe, uh, we got busy making sure that employers who use these uh, draft them and, and implement them in compliance with the act. Now, I'll be honest with you. I am not a big fan of non-compete agreements. Uh, they're hard to enforce. They're even harder to enforce now that the Freedom to Work Act has been amended. So I would think carefully about when you use them and and consult with counsel. And of course, uh, my one rule for all employers is always do what's in the best interest of the employer and we'll deal with the fallout uh, that occurs on the legal front. Okay, finally, something that has been controversial in Illinois, but it's been done, and it's consistent with what's happening all across the country as, um, uh, as a result of uh, mostly, well, actually entirely, um, governors and, of course, the president uh, who are uh, trying to push a progressive agenda and Illinois, of course, is at the forefront of that. Uh, and what this has to do with, do with is the joint, so-called joint employer rule. Joint employer rules, and it's what the NLRB is doing that I referenced earlier, and it's what some state legislatures are doing, including Illinois. The joint employer rule is a regulatory effort to try to expand the definition of an employee's employer in order to include more employers to be liable for a myriad of violations that employers can, 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 can uh, conduct or do. So it deals with, in our case, in Illinois, in the case of Illinois, it's the Department of Labor, which then means who's an employee, uh, 
who's responsible for wage and hour violations, who's responsible for OSHA type violations, you know, who's responsible for unemployment insurance. Uh, with the NLRB and the IDHR or and the uh, EEOC and the Illinois Department of Human Rights, uh, it's about who's the employer for liability for labor law violations, for human rights uh, violations. Uh, and so it's, it's an attempt to expand the universe of entities who can be liable for these legal violations. So Illinois, not to be uh, un, outdone, has adopted a, a rule through the Illinois Department of Labor, uh, which is, was initially published in August of 2021, but it is now uh, a regulation of the Illinois Department of Labor that expands the definition of who's a joint employer of an employee. And essentially they say that two or more employers may be associated with each other in relation to an individual employee in such a way that they jointly employ the individual under the Illinois minimum wage law uh, if the facts establish that they are joint employers uh, and then the rule sets out what those factors are. Uh, and uh, some of them are traditional factors, uh, others are not. One is the employee's work is benefits the alleged joint employer. The work performed is an integral part of the alleged joint employer's business or businesses. The alleged joint employer has direct or indirect, figure that one out, we'll be litigating that for years, direct or indirect control or influence over the employee's terms or conditions of employment, including schedule and quality of work. The alleged joint employer owns or leases the premises to where the work is performed or provides tools and materials used by employees, which means that uh, entities that own the workplace where the work occurs might be on the hook for a labor law violation. Uh, the, and the final factor, uh, the alleged joint employer has direct or indirect control over the other joint employer's operations through contractual obligations, shared joint management, direct or indirect ownership interest, or economic dependence. That's the economic realities test. Now, if think about what this could mean. Uh, if you're a franchisee, what if you're a, a uh, temporary help agency? Uh, this has now become, uh, and it's going to lead to a ton of litigation and expense for employers and alleged joint employers uh, under these rules. So. Uh, the regulation itself, which you can find on the Illinois Department of Labor website, gives some examples. But those examples are just examples. I mean, if they want to enforce this uh, aggressively, uh, it's going to be a real uh, problem for employers uh, who are the alleged joint employers. Uh, you know, McDonald's. Uh, are they going to be a joint employer with all of its franchisees across the state? Um, you know, it, think of the implications of this. You know, that's already been tried and lost, which is one of the reasons why we have the regulation. So uh, there'll be challenges and there will be court cases, of course, you know, keep us lawyers busy for years to come, one hopes. Uh, but all kidding aside, it's more and more of obstacles to employers being able to carry out their missions without the diversion and expense of legal issues. Uh, and so uh, to sort of wrap things up, uh, be on the lookout for all of these changes, uh, pay attention to and follow higher level uh, on Twitter and on uh, LinkedIn 
and its other social media platforms. Uh, also, uh, feel free to follow me uh, and my law firm at sandbergphoenix.com. And I see there is a question. Uh, no, yes. Uh, let me see here. No. Uh, all right. So I am sorry that we had a technical problem today, but uh, in honor of your time, uh, I think we'll uh, call it quits. And I thank you very much for your participation and attention. And again, thanks to Higher Level for providing the platform for this webinar. Thank you all and go out there and manage. Absolutely. Thank you so much today. Um, I know you can't hear me, John, but thank you. Um, our appreciation to John for his presentation. So much critical information for our employers out there in Illinois. Just want to remind all of our attendees that right now we are offering one hour of free HR consultation. We can help you better assess your company needs, including addressing any compliance concerns that you may have. Um, you can reach out to me. I did post my email address in the chat, or you can call Higher Level at 618-993-8836. We are going to have our next um, high notes on Wednesday, April 27th. That will be at 9.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. And the topic will be diversity recruiting and second chance hiring in 2022. I hope you'll join us and you can register on our website at www.higherlevel.com. Thanks and have a great day.